Thank goodness you're awake, Rev. I mean, thank goodness you're awake, Ass Muncher 43. Now come on, the Endar Spire is under attack, and we've got to get off this ship. I'm just some character who's hopefully not gonna die within five minutes of meeting the main character. Now come on, we don't have much time. Bastila's the commanding officer of the Endar Spire, and if you play your cards right, she could be a potential romance option somewhere down the line. Bastila's physical attractiveness is irrelevant to our current mission, which is getting the fuck off the Endar Spire, you goddamn retard! If you're some kind of idiot, or this is your first time playing a video game, I can run through the basic controls with you, but hopefully we don't get blasted to fucking smithereens while you're learning how to press the A button. Alright then, let's get moving. These Sith must be the advanced boarding party for the Republic! If you've heard of any Star Wars video game out there in cyberspace, then you've no doubt heard about Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic. I mean, the title itself just sounds so badass, and the cover is stylized just like the movie posters, signaling to you, hey buddy, if you play this game, you'd better get ready to experience a story as good as any of the films. Knights of the Old Republic, abbreviated as KOTOR, is often hailed by many to be the best Star Wars video game ever made. And boy, let me tell ya, with the massive, seemingly endless number of games in this titanic franchise, that's saying a whole lot. By the same token, it is also considered to be one of the greatest video games of all time. With a reputation like that, the countless awards, people calling it the 2003 Game of the Year, and with the power of the Star Wars logo and brand behind it, KOTOR is definitely one of the most important games from the last two decades. But has the game aged as well as some others? Has KOTOR become outdated? And is it truly worthy of being called one of the greatest of all time? And does it honestly possess a timeless story? Well. Let's break into people's houses, murder them, then take their stuff, get lectured by an old black guy, and search for the star maps straight into this. KOTOR came out on the original Xbox, and it's no wonder Microsoft was able to break into the console market when they had some of the best goddamn exclusives of any console in history. Honestly, Microsoft was never widely known for their exclusive RPGs, in fact, all three Xboxes were somewhat notorious for not possessing a killer RPG. But KOTOR was that killer app. Besides Halo, it gave me a reason to brag to all those gay station fanboys, and they always agreed. Yeah, I love the PlayStation, they'd say, but goddamn, I wish I could play KOTOR. The point I want to make right off the bat is a game like this totally changed people's minds about the Xbox and its catalog of games. An exclusive single-player Star Wars RPG? And critics are calling it one of the best ever made? Well, slap my nuts and call me a Jawa, I'ma get me an Xbox. That's the type of power this game had. KOTOR's gameplay is vastly different from most other games and even other RPGs. I'll explain this in a bit. Now, Bioware had gotten some renown with their incredible Baldur's Gate games, Neverwinter Nights, and damn. They really liked using Dungeons and Dragons as a basis for their games. But anyways, Bioware wasn't all that well known back in the day, and when this fire, this absolute butter, came out, they made a name for themselves. They force pushed their way into the spotlight and let the whole galaxy know they meant business. I mean, if you look at how Bioware has made their games ever since KOTOR, you can clearly see them trying to replicate the same things that made it so great. Dialogue choices, morality system, intricate world design, compelling dynamic characters, all that good shit. Somebody's been drinking. What most people know of Bioware and what they think about them as a company stems from Knights of the Old Republic. 
So just to be clear, I'm going to be using footage from two different playthroughs. One with mods, one without. Also some videos from YouTube because it's a real bitch to track down all the moments and dialogue that I talk about. So if things look different between the footage, that's why. Now I'm not gonna lie, because I'd get dark side points and I'm trying to stay light side, but the gameplay is definitely clunky and so is the movement. I reckon most of this is due to the AI of the time, and like the weird automated paths characters take. In fact, one of the more frustrating things is when you get stuck on NOTHING? The fuck's blocking me right now, the AIR? It's also annoying as balls when the other two companions don't follow you when you charge into battle fighting off 8 million rat ghouls. But to be fair, when you boot up a game from 2003, you should know what you're getting into. No game is ever perfect, and these mild technical problems are nothing close to game-breaking. It's frustrating, yeah, but getting stuck on a corner every 30 minutes is worth the 40 hours of excellent story. This style of gameplay really didn't appeal to me as a kid. I didn't quite understand it. I wanted something self-explanatory and simple, like Jedi Academy or Jedi Outcast. But since I've grown up, I see the magic in it. It's a brilliant combination of action and strategy. Although to this day, I still don't fully understand how the system and numbers work. I know it's based on dice rolls, dungeons and dragons, whatnot. But regardless, the combat intrigued me. It was always fun experimenting with different builds, choosing talents, force powers, feats. Upgrading your gear and dishing out the best equipment to your favorite characters. The ability to pause and set up your plan of attack was a wonderful idea. Oftentimes you'd get to a hard part, and after dying a few times you'd know what's coming next. So smart players could plant mines, power up beforehand, set their companions in the best place. While younger me didn't understand this back in the day, thankfully I've realized that KOTOR isn't just another mindless beat-em-up. And for that, it stands out from the crowd. Earlier I mentioned the gameplay is vastly different to most RPGs. That's in part because most RPGs were either full-on action or turn-based like the Final Fantasy games. Occasionally there's a game like Paper Mario that comes along and combines the two, but for the most part these two styles of gameplay were hardly ever meshed together. KOTOR is different also because the combat is only a portion of the gameplay. There's actually a ton of mini-games and puzzles to solve, from swoop races to pure pizzazz, and of course the dueling arena. There's enough variety in the game that keeps things fresh throughout. One of the coolest moments in the game is when you're on Kashyyyk, and in order to access the star map, you're given a sort of morality quiz. It tests you on what a Sith leader, such as Revan, would do when posed with various tactical military choices. The point of this puzzle is to show the player how concerns over morality can compromise victory in war. Kashyyyk is also home to the most fucking annoying sound effect ever conceived. It's bad enough they do this while you're talking to people, but what's worse is it never fucking stops. All dinner. 152 attempts by human Jolie Bindo. All dinner. Kobe stopped, I guess. Error. The game has a great addition in the form of terminals and robots you can reprogram using spikes and repair parts. If you've got enough supplies and a character with the right skills, you can make really tough areas a lot easier, or even take out a whole room of bad guys. No other game I've seen really has a mechanic like this, and it adds another layer of depth, strategy, pre-planning. There's a lot of nuances in the form of managing items like grenades, shields, and stimulants. Alongside your force powers, this can get a little complicated, but it makes the gameplay more strategic and rewarding when you do succeed. The choices you make in battle are just as important as the ones you make through the story. So it strikes a nice, ehehe, <laughs> balance. One important thing with RPGs is that they maintain a consistent challenge from start to finish, and KOTOR does a damn good job of that, for the most part. Near the end, if you've been doing most of the side quests, you'll be pretty overpowered, but all the bosses and even Malak are not to be taken lightly. See, when a game offers a good challenge throughout its entirety, it means the player is more likely to finish it because no matter how far they progress, they're still overcoming a new challenge. But even if you're the type of person who hates this type of gameplay, there's no question that KOTOR is worth playing for the story alone. And a game like that is a rare find indeed. The big thing with KOTOR is your main character can't do everything, so strategy is a very important factor in your success. 
You can cover most of the bases yourself, but you'll need to figure out who best to take with you so that you can pick up mines or hack terminals, etc. For the first part of the game, team composition is very important. Though I'll admit, once you get Joe Lee and Juhani, you pretty much just take Jedi with you the rest of the way. But I don't, because you can get some real interesting dialogue by switching up partners. And I like the concept of going on an epic journey and taking everyone along with you at some point. It's also important what class you pick at the start, because I think the Scoundrel is the only class that can max out Persuasion. And you're gonna want Persuasion, trust me. If you plan on seeing and choosing the most interesting options the game has to offer, it's essential. But if you really think about it, a good chunk of the game is actually you talking to people, making decisions, learning about the Jedi, the Sith, the Force, the galaxy, and the history that binds them. So let's take a look at the other side of KOTOR's gameplay, and arguably the most important. The biggest reason for KOTOR's success is its brilliant writing. How impatient can one person be? You must have driven your mother mad. All that gurgling and fussing. <laughs> Babies are cute, but annoying. The designs of the characters, the dialogue, perceptions of morality, and the choices you make along the way are all concepts introduced in the films. Again, it's like poetry, it's sort of they rhyme. And KOTOR allows you to play through that. A grand adventure, just like the movies, but you make the choices. And the feeling of power, satisfaction that KOTOR creates with this system is something few games have ever achieved. It's no secret these dialogue trees and morality systems have been implemented in so many games after KOTOR. Now, it's not the game that pioneered these mechanics. There have been different variations of this, like in the old Fallout games, Ace Attorney, Morrowind, and probably some other games, but KOTOR certainly brought these ideas to the mainstream. Character influence wasn't in the first game, but KOTOR 2 brought it in a year later. All these facets have become staples of Bioware games, but why? Why were these dialogue choices and morality systems replicated so much after KOTOR 1? Well, because it's fucking great! As opposed to a game that plays the same way every time, the player can significantly alter events with their choices, resulting in vastly different outcomes. They mostly fall into light or dark side categories, but even though simplistic, it offers immense replay value. If you play light side, you'll probably be thinking, what would have happened in this one scenario had you approached it from the dark side, and vice versa. The game does have numerous points where you have the illusion of choice, in that the game could give you three options that all result in the same response. Your words mean nothing to me. But you only realize that after you've played through two or three times, which is totally fine. One of the most fun things about KOTOR is the encounters. Those moments when you walk by a group of NPCs and you're forced into some dialogue. Ooh, hey, look at this. It's the ship. <laughs> Ooh, no, I'm so scared. Ooh. Pro tip, anytime you see a bunch of NPCs, shit is most certainly going to go down. This really does make the game exciting, especially on the first playthrough, because you're thrust into these moments where you need to make decisions. You're put on the spotlight and you don't know what to expect. The game keeps you on your toes, and it helps with all the downtime of running around and doing the main quest. Sometimes you might be able to prevent a fight breaking out, or you could take part in the fight, threaten people and take their credits. It's invigorating. You feel powerful. Sometimes I'd spend like five plus minutes deciding over which option to pick when talking to someone. The amount of thought I could put into these decisions shows how deep and impactful they are to the player and how much they care about what they're doing. Now KOTOR wouldn't be half as interesting if it wasn't fully voice acted, which is great because some characters really embellish their roles and I find that freaking hilarious. Oh, hello again. Oh, you didn't come to make a complain about the mess in the building. I keep asking for an assistant. Is somebody out there? Fishy, fishy, fishy. <laughs> come and eat me too. <laughs> With the amount of voice acting that must have gone into this game, it's incredible how good the voices are. From one-off NPCs to merchants, important characters, and of course your companions. The excellent writing and great voice acting go hand in hand to truly immerse you in this world and make you care about what's going on. 
You can understand what's at stake based on the emotion and tone of voice NPCs speak in. The game does reuse character models and the animations look pretty funny nowadays, but it's totally fine because of the time this game came out and how vast it is. The dialogue from the aliens was a really nice touch as well. Granted, they probably did this for budget and data reasons as it would have been easier to reuse the same lines for different aliens. And though it's kind of annoying to hear the same thing over and over and over, it feels like Star Wars. Cause it'd be weird if every alien talked in Galactic Basic. One thing you might not have noticed is depending on the important nouns, the alien dialogue can be completely unique to that sentence or line. For instance, you can hear Azure say, Star Killer, amongst the other flabby noises he makes. It's a level of detail I think most people missed. And these alien voices, overall, are an excellent world-building tool. But what really makes KOTOR so memorable is the companions, the characters that tag along with you and your travels. Every one of them has a backstory, a motivation for what they're doing, and it's up to you if you want to unravel that and learn more about them. Which brings up a very important point. KOTOR is as immersive and as long of a journey as you want it to be. You might be the type of player who wants to find every nook and cranny. You may want to learn about every detail about the worlds, lore, universe, and characters. Or you might only care for what's essential. Either way, you're not forced to talk to some protocol droid for 10 minutes, but you can choose to talk to him. And that's such a great thing about KOTOR. Not every NPC is essential to talk to. Like there's this weird alien in the cantina who appears to serve no purpose other than to immerse the player in the city of Terrace and shed light on a bizarre planet and alien species. It's not essential, you don't get any XP, but it's there. And that's why people get so invested into these games, because the main story is surrounded by stuff that is equally as interesting. But going back to the companions, you know you've got great characters when you can describe each one of them in detail, what makes them tick, and all that. Quite honestly, I could discuss these characters in depth for hours, but we'll keep it somewhat brief. The first real character to join you is Karth Onassi. Sorry, Trask Olgo. Now, Karth's kind of an annoying dickhead at first, but you learn he's got trust issues. Karth can be a potential romance option if you play as a female, but it's not as interesting or fleshed out as the alternative. He was a soldier who really believed in the chain of command, but was betrayed by his commanding officer at the time, which resulted in the deaths of millions of people. Karth has a great sense of guilt following him, because he lost his family in this attack. He lost everything. His side quest revolves around getting revenge against Saul Kareth, and finding his lost son Dusto, both of which are very interesting scenarios. It's even possible to kill Karth's son right in front of him, which is really fucked up. Good god. Or you can save him and help him see the light. I'm proud of you, Dusto. You aren't hanging on to a lie after you see it for what it is. Not everyone could do that. Maybe after this is all over, we can talk. I'm still not sure about us, but I'll listen. Maybe we can get back to where we should have been. Well, I'd like that. But even though he's a mostly serious guy, Karth doesn't mind cracking a joke or giving a sarcastic comment. My lightsaber was misplaced. Wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You lost your lightsaber? <laughs> I mean, isn't that a violation of some kind of Jedi code or something? Because his loyalty and Saul was met with betrayal, Karth began expecting the worst from people. But because Revan was patient, listened, and put his trust in Karth, he learned forgiveness. The next person to group up is Mission Vow, who looks like a young rogue. She learned to live on her own at a real young age, and she can be kind of a brat at times. Are you ready to have a civil chat, or is this going to be another childish tantrum? Tantrum? I'm trying to apologize, you nerf herder. Nerf herder! But as you do her side quest and travel with her, she starts to mature. She's pretty energetic and inquisitive, and despite her troubled childhood, manages to keep a positive outlook. We found a young Twi'lek in the back. She's got quite the mouth on her. She swore at me and spit on my uniform. 
She tried to bite me through my armor, and you should hear what she said about my mother. Mission can take care of herself, but is still innocent and a bit naive. She doesn't totally understand the world and the galaxy. Early on, she really believes in her brother. But when you actually track him down, you and her both realize that Griff is a pretty shitty brother who cares more about credits than he does his sister. Mission is a troubled youth growing up in a difficult place in a difficult time. And she's the first one to jump to your defense when your true identity is revealed. Because before anyone else, Mission saw the good within you. Hey, you've got nothing to be sorry about. You didn't ask for this. Besides, I know you. You're not Revan anymore. Whatever you used to be, you're one of us now. Not too long after recruiting Mission, you rescue Zalbar, a Wookiee, and he pledges a life debt to you. He seems pretty quiet and stoic, but when you travel with him to Kashyyyk, you learn he's got some demons in his past. His dad went missing, Zalbar got exiled, and his brother took over and is selling his own people to slavers. You and Zolbar work together to either free the Wookiees from Zerka or side with Chundar. Once you're finished with Kashyyyk, Zolbar doesn't say much, which is a shame. But his best moments come when he banters with Mission. Zolbar is honorable and loyal, and he takes great pride in the traditions of the Wookiees, though he does not think highly of himself, feeling great shame because of his exile. After that, you rescue Bastila Shan who alongside Karth is the most important companion. She's a young Jedi with a great weight on her shoulders. Her battle meditation ability is prized and valued beyond belief by the Jedi Council. This puts a lot of pressure on her, and she tries to remain calm and collected and adhere to the Jedi Code, but she constantly struggles with that. I don't know, it shouldn't be so hard not to think of you. It should be easy not to think of you. I should have discipline, Jedi discipline. Every time I try to call on all my teachings to calm myself, they fail me. In addition to being a major part of the main story, Basil has got a side quest where you find her mother, and depending on your choices, things can go well or terribly. Besides Jo Lee, she's the most interesting of the group. She has a fall from grace, turns to the dark side, and ends up completely changing her views. You are strong, child. But I will break you. I'll never fall to the dark side. How could it be that such a rigid, strict adherent of the Jedi could be turned so easily? Bastila's character arc shows how enticing the dark side is, and how it takes incredible self-control to restrain oneself. When Bastila attacked Revan, a forced bond between them was created. Visions of both of their pasts were seeped into the other's mind. Perhaps it was this bond that allowed her to fall to the dark side, experiencing Revan's darkest moments. Perhaps it was the love she felt for Revan as they traveled together. Either way, this bond is why she follows you, and it's the driving force of the story. In some ways you make me feel weak, like I'm caught up in the wake of our destiny. But at the same time, you make me feel stronger, more alive. I realize now these feelings are part of the bond we share. Through choosing the correct lines of dialogue, you can romance with Bastila, cause why wouldn't you? Oh my. You tease her, compliment her, and this starts to wear down the Jedi protection, the armor she so desperately covered herself in. There's a battle on Rakata where you can try to bring her back towards the light, and she's completely forsaken the Jedi. Listen to me. The dark side leads to death and destruction. I've seen the horrors the Sith have unleashed on the galaxy. Turn away from this path. Shut up, old man. Your time is over. The age of the Jedi and the Republic is no more. This is the age of Darth Revan and the Sith. What's really messed up is if you go dark side, you end up killing four of your companions on Rakata. And because of that, I just can't play dark side. But on the Star Forge, when you fight Bastila for the last time, she believes your weakness stems from adhering to the light. After you beat her, Bastila begs you to kill her. But if you've been romancing her through the power of love, you can convince her to come back to the light. You love me. There was a time I yearned for and yet dreaded to hear those words. I loved you too, but I could never face who you were. And it's just such an incredible subplot that I had to cover it because there's no better motivation than love. I mean, there's a reason she's on the front cover, you know. Eventually, you team up with Candorus, a Mandalorian who helps you escape Terrace. This guy is a fucking badass, alright? He's focused, aggressive, disciplined, and ambitious. 
He doesn't mince words or waste time with small talk. Bold talk from a broken down mercenary who is serving at Davik's heel. I'd call you his pet cat hound, but they have enough loyalty not to turn on their masters. Insults? Maybe if your master had trained your lightsaber to be as quick as your tongue, you could have escaped those Vulkers, you spoiled little Jedi princess. Mandalorians value combat and battle above all else, and so Candorus has plenty of war stories to share with you. After losing the Mandalorian Wars, he too was lost, looking for purpose but never able to find satisfaction. The pride and honor of the Mandalorian race was stripped. His disappointment at what the Mandalorians have become is what motivates him. He craves excitement, the call of battle that all Mandalorians feel in their veins, and the honor one earns through victory in combat. And because of this, Candorus joins you, hoping to regain his pride and find his calling in life once more. Light side, dark side, it doesn't make any difference to me, Riven. I'll stick by you no matter what comes. When you're on Dantooine, you're given a task by the Jedi Council to rid this local grove of the tainted evil. That evil turns out to be a Cathar named Juhani. After beating her in combat, you can tell her to seek redemption from the Jedi Council because of the bad things she's done. After this, she insists on joining you. It's revealed that Juhani had a very troubled upbringing. Her father was killed on Terrace, and her mother borrowed money from the exchange in order to take care of her. Eventually, Juhani's mother collapsed in a cantina and never recovered. She was forced into slavery and being treated like livestock birthed a dark hatred within her. Funny enough, a group of Jedi, led by Revan, freed her from the slavers, and this inspired her to become a Jedi. Juhani struggles with her emotions more than the others. Her fierce determination to become the ideal Jedi is what ironically led her to the dark side, as she couldn't accept failure. She didn't fully understand the teachings of her master, and she repeatedly lashes out against you when discussing her past. She holds a lot of resentment towards the people and groups that made her life hell growing up, and her side quest is about seeking revenge on the slaver who killed her dad and tried to purchase her as a slave. But with you at her side, you help her resist the temptation for revenge, and Juhani becomes stronger because of it. After our last battle, Quatra had nothing left to teach me. I needed time alone to explore the turmoil of my own spirit. Only then was I ready to follow a guide. You, back to the light. By traveling to Kashyyyk, you find Jolie Bindo, an old hermit who lives in the dangerous shadowlands below the tall trees. He's somewhat of an enigma, with unclear motives, desires, and seemingly incoherent stories to tell with little to no point. But beneath all the crazy, is a man with incredible wisdom and an incredible story. Jolie is one of the best things to come out of Star Wars, because as far as I know, he's one of two characters in the entire universe who side with neither the light or dark, but settle in between. Without the guidance of the Council, how can you avoid falling to the dark side? Well, I've managed to avoid it the last 20 years or so. Besides, light side, dark side, they don't mean the same to me as they do to you. I don't see in absolutes. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. He's not willing to ignore his natural human desires like love and be a part of the rigid Jedi, but he's in control of his emotions enough to not fall to the dark side and become Sith. Love doesn't lead to the dark side. Passion can lead to rage and fear and can be controlled, but passion is not the same thing as love. Controlling your passions while being in love, that's what they should teach you to beware. But love itself will save you, not condemn you. He's the only character in the game who truly understands the flaws of both ideologies and how both lead to destruction in some form or another. I want to stop Malak as much as anyone, but I don't have to join the Order to do it. Look at Karth or Kandorus. They're with us in this quest, but they aren't Jedi. The capacity for good or evil, like the Force itself, is in all living creatures. And belonging to the Jedi Order, or the Sith, or any group, won't change what you are at your core. Joe Lee comes with you because he sees a great destiny about you. And it's not clear what this means until much later. Alongside Bastila and Malak, he's the only character that knows your true identity, before you do. He's got two side quests, one where you help his friend Sunri in a murder trial, and another where you uncover his origins, 
why he was on Kashyyyk and all that. It turns out his wife was a Sith and he was a Jedi. When you talk with Joe Lee and listen to what he has to say, not only is the character, Revan, learning, but the player is as well. Joe Lee's teachings and stories stretch beyond the contained world of KOTOR and the Star Wars universe. Look, everybody always figures the time they live in is the most epic, most important age to end all ages. But tyrants and heroes rise and fall, and historians sort out the pieces. The only companion who kinda sucks is T3M4. Now, don't get me wrong, he's freaking awesome as a character in KOTOR 2, but in this game he doesn't really say or do anything special. And finally, we have quite possibly the coolest character in the Star Wars universe. An undercover assassination droid built by Revan to facilitate communications and put an end to hostilities. I am a law-abiding droid. Yes, indeed. Law-abiding. That's me. Masquerading as a protocol droid, we learned that HK was created to eliminate high-profile targets in an attempt by Revan to maintain galactic stability and avoid costly wars. After Revan was captured, HK-47 moved around several different owners, none of whom understood what he was or respected his purpose. Being used for menial tasks, chores, HK grew a bitter resentment towards all organic meat bags and started hating them, specifically his owners. After you purchase him on Tatooine, you use his translator to communicate with the Sand People, though HK would prefer to blast them all. You can settle things peacefully though. He's a comically bloodthirsty droid, noted for his hatred of pacifism and kindness. HK is quite unlike anything else, and he takes great pride in his capabilities, his uniqueness, and has immense respect for his original designer. Upon learning he returned to his original master, HK's memory core is reactivated and all his assassination protocols are restored. Even if the player is light-sided and prefers the path of non-violence, HK still respects you, knowing that it was by your devious designs that he exists in the first place. Throughout the game, your companions will interact with each other from time to time, often resulting in hilarious and insightful conversations. Why not just shoot them where they stand? It would at least be more direct. Observation. Yes, very efficient. It is what I would do. Of course that's what you would do. See, KOTOR isn't just a game where all these people follow you and only talk to you. They feel like real people all coming together with a common interest, but various reasons for what they're doing. Your companions react to how you handle certain choices. They'll interject with their thoughts and approval or disapproval. It's nice to get feedback from the people around you and you learn more about them. But most importantly, through you, the player, every companion can find their salvation. It is your choices, your destiny as Revan, that allows you to bring your companions that which they need most. A leader you can trust. A friend who looks out for you. A man who respects your traditions and helps you reconcile with your past. A warrior you can fight besides, who brings you honor and is worthy of your loyalty. A student who listens and learns from your teachings. A man who saved you from a life of servitude. The ideal Jedi that inspires you. Your owner and creator. The only one who understands and respects what you are. And a lover who would risk his life to save yours, who believes in you no matter what. It's because of these companions and how they play off of you that KOTOR has such a great story and universe, a Star Wars game driven by its characters who are all connected to you, the player. It's such a gripping, powerful concept that in this instance is executed perfectly. Knights of the Old Republic is the type of game that absolutely should be played at least twice. Once blind, so you can take everything in, learn the mechanics, choose a side, experiment, and the second playthrough so you can see all the foreshadowing, go through on a harder difficulty, and pick different choices. The game has immense replay value, and you won't pick up everything your first time through. I used to play as a dark side male, but honestly, it's just perfect if you play as a light-sided male. That's the canon way to play this game. You can essentially play through four times and have a completely different experience. Light and dark-sided male, light and dark-sided female. 
The story starts off simple enough, and right from the get-go they drop subtle hints for the ultimate twist near the end. You're thrust into this huge conflict that you know nothing about, just out of the blue you wake up, and you're in Shit Creek. So your goal is to escape the Endar Spire and link up with Bastila. You meet a bunch of those companions along the way, do some side quests, and escape Terrace. After this you head to Dantooine where Bastila goes to talk to the Jedi Council about something important. The Council agrees to train you as a Jedi so you can use the Force on your journey to locate the star maps which will lead to the ultimate Sith weapon, the Star Forge. The Star Forge allows for fleets of ships to be created unreasonably fast. So your main goal throughout the game is to destroy the Star Forge, defeat Malak, and either free the galaxy from his terrible reign, or usurp his throne and claim the mantle of Dark Lord for yourself. The story itself is pretty straightforward, but like a good RPG and what I mentioned before, you can choose to go through the way you want to. After Dantooine, you can go to any of the four planets. The idea of setting KOTOR 4,000 years before the events of the films was an interesting one indeed, but certainly allowed for near complete control and freedom for Bioware, without being forced to make a game that ties in with the films. Bioware chose to explore the seemingly untapped history of Star Wars. All the things that make a good Star Wars movie are here. Great action, Jedi vs. Sith, amazing characters, breathtaking worlds, an epic quest, and an amazing sci-fi universe that immerses you completely. Everything in KOTOR 1 is recognizable and familiar to the average Star Wars fan, but it also brings a lot of new things to the table that make it stand out. They even included a few references to the movies. What's also a really cool parallel between KOTOR and the films, and you probably didn't notice this, but Boba and Jango Fett are Mandalorians and descendants of Cassus Fett, whose armor can be found in the game. This means all the soldiers cloned from Jango are Mandalorians too. So essentially, in the Star Wars universe, there were two Mandalorian Wars, separated by 4,000 years. Mind-blowing, isn't it? Now I mentioned this in my Star Wars Battlefront 2 EA review, but it's such an important point I'll reiterate. KOTOR 1's story is great because it focuses less on what you're doing and more so on why you're doing all these things. It keeps the plot simple, easy to follow, and that's the brilliant part. For the majority of the game, you don't know why you're so qualified to track down the star maps. You don't know why you're so special that the council goes against their own rules to train you. You're a neophyte Padawan who's been saddled with the responsibility of tracking down these star maps. Why? That's not normal. You don't know why you were on the Endar Spire, or any of this shit. KOTOR has such an interesting story, because for most of the game, why the player is such an integral part in the events is left a mystery. It's slowly revealed over time, until the Big Bang happens. You cannot hide from what you once were, Revan. Recognize that you were once the Dark Lord, and know that I have taken your place. The amount of subtle foreshadowing is phenomenal. Characters, NPCs, your companions, they all feel something special about you, but can't quite put their finger on it. And nobody could have guessed the twist of the game. It's simply stunning, just mind-blowingly brilliant. The big reveal on the Leviathan is quite possibly the greatest twist in video game history. Up until this point, you've been hearing all about Revan. Revan is the one who gathered soldiers and Jedi to fight the Mandalorians when the Council did nothing. Revan was the one who turned to the dark side and discovered the Star Forge. Revan was the master of the main villain of the game. He was at first a savior, then became a conqueror. Savior, conqueror, hero, villain, you are all things, Revan, and yet you are nothing. And yet, when you begin on Terrace, Karth tells you this. Everything I know about Malak is pretty much common knowledge. He escaped the trap that killed Darth Revan, his Sith master. With Revan's death, Malak became the new Dark Lord. So your first time playing, you believe him, because why would the game lie to you about that? It seemed like harmless exposition, but in reality it was to set up the expectation that Revan was just an important figure of the events prior to the game. In fact, Karth was telling the truth. Revan was killed, but it wasn't his body, it was his mind. When I saw this reveal for the first time, 
and I saw Revan on Korriban taking off his helmet and showing my face. I was in shock. I just sat there for 10 minutes listening to Malak and I, I just couldn't believe it. This is the genius of the writing and the character Revan. Because he isn't voiced during dialogue sections, you are immersed as Revan. His amnesia is your amnesia. His choices are your choices, and his revelation is your revelation. If you play KOTOR the canonical way, it's an incredible story of redemption and finding your identity. It teaches you that nobody is defined completely by what they did in the past, that no matter the crimes you may have committed, there is always a chance to be saved or to save yourself. Which brings me to Malik, the main villain. Along having the coolest voice ever, Malik is just a badass. Your predecessor once made the mistake of questioning my orders, Admiral. Surely you are not so foolish as to make the same mistake. He may not be the deepest or most complex villain, but in this story he works perfectly. And there's a good reason for that. Because of the history between him and you. You learn the history of the Mandalorian Wars, the fall of Revan and Malak, throughout the game. And when you're finally confronted with the truth of your identity, you've heard so much about both characters that your motivations for taking down Malak is more than just, I gotta save the galaxy. You, you've got a vendetta against this motherfucker. You need to settle the score. The apprentice has become the master. He's taken your place. Are you just gonna sit there and let him? There's a lot of history between these characters. You both went down the same path to the dark side. You led Malak there with you. And now it's your duty as Revan to undo what you've done. What I love most is when you play light-sided, after beating Malak, you're able to redeem him right before his death. It's such a touching scene. Here's this big bad villain who you've been told countless times you need to defeat. He's an awful guy, a piece of shit. Evil, rotten to the core. But he was your friend, your apprentice, your brother. And despite every terrible action he had done, here he is, the Dark Lord of the Sith, thinking about what would have happened if things were different. This game does an incredible job of world and universe building. Every world you visit is rich with detail, it's vibrant, the planets feel alive, and you get invested into what's happening on each of them. Every planet has some kind of crisis going on, and something new to teach you that ties in with their location. You learn about different species living together on the diverse world of Terrace. You learn the Jedi ways on the tranquil planet of Dantooine. You learn about the harshness of life on the coarse, rough, and irritating Tatooine. You discover history and traditions as old as the dense forests of Kashyyyk. You engage in diplomacy and politics on the neutral water world of Manan. You learn strength, cruelty, and self-service on the ruthless world of Korriban. And you get lost in mystery on the alienated Rakata Prime. The level of detail and uniqueness with every location brings KOTOR to life. You get a sense of how vast the galaxy really is, and why it's so important to defeat Malak. The Rakata are most fascinating because of their rise and fall. You learn that they used to be the cold-blooded, unrelenting rulers of the galaxy. Their society was known as the Infinite Empire, but at the height of their power, after the construction of the Star Forge, it began feeding on their evil intentions, their hatred and dark side tendencies. Eventually, through a series of revolts, conflicts and inner fighting, the Rakata lost their connection to the Force permanently and were reduced to nothing more than primitive tribes vying for control of a tiny lost world. The rise and fall of a person, group, or organization is a constant within the Star Wars universe. But what KOTOR brought to Star Wars was something more valuable than any other game had brought up to this point because it actually fleshes out the Jedi and the Sith, what makes them who they are, and both ideologies are based off of real-world philosophies. The Jedi are altruistic, taught that self-sacrifice, a life lived for others, is the path to enlightenment. Concepts such as mercy, redemption, forgiveness are core to the Jedi philosophy, and the code is all about purging emotions, purging the self, so that only the good of others remains. The Jedi philosophy is very similar to Buddhism, and this is clearly seen in the final line of the Jedi Code. There is no death, 
there is the Force, as one of Buddhism's core ideas is that of rebirth after death. On the flip side, the Sith are self-serving, valuing strength, independence, and identity above all. Taught that through tapping into their emotions, using them as your power, is the way to free oneself. The Sith embody the philosophy of will to power, which is the idea that the driving force of humanity is achievement, ambition, and the desire to reach the top. The Sith have a much more loose structure of government because it is not viewed as a crime to kill someone and take their place. Weakness is a crime that is punished with death. And in fact, you are encouraged to kill as part of the Sith. Because only the strongest are fit to lead. And through the leadership of the strongest is how the Sith survive. They use their powers and life to further themselves. And just like the Jedi, this is shown in the final line of the Sith Code. The Force shall free me. As the idea of will to power is the driving force of humanity, your will, your accomplishments are what shall free you. This is the duality of Star Wars. One side lives for the well-being of others, one side lives for the well-being of themselves. But what is brilliantly illuminated through Bastila and Joe Lee's character arcs is that neither the Sith or Jedi have a perfect code or ideology. While the Jedi act as peacekeepers, it was their inaction that drove the other Jedi to war and the dark side, the inability to accept blame, the self-righteousness. The Jedi's biggest conflict was they could not separate themselves from their ego. And this also prevented Bastila from living her life in the way she truly wanted. Who truly wants a loveless life of self-sacrifice? And while the Sith may be a dominating force to be reckoned with, capable of great things, their system of rule revolves around power and individuality. It's a dictatorship governed by the strongest and most treacherous, with those who seek power often forgetting why they sought it in the first place. All the things I wanted to do, all the wrongs I wanted to right, I haven't done any of it. They just get farther and farther from my mind. All I've cared about is power. Eventually leading them to work only towards maintaining and increasing that power. It's a constant struggle for control, and the Sith can never find stability or use their power and influence to a higher goal. You know, it's rare to find a game that is so thought-provoking and ties into real-world philosophy like this. What's crazy to think is these ideologies play a background role against the main story, and they could be analyzed for hours. I find these types of stories so intriguing, and I just love talking about them and sharing my thoughts, and I hope you guys feel the same. This side of Star Wars is the reason why so many people love it, because we learn so much about ourselves, we learn what it means to be human, and it gives us an applicable perspective to the real world. And all that from a damn video game. In conclusion, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic is the type of game that you enjoy every minute of playing. It's an experience that can be analyzed and talked about for hours on end, with its stories, dialogue, and ideologies providing so many forms of interpretation so many things to learn about ourselves and the world around us. It has memorable characters and companions you grow to like and care for, a system of morality and choices that empower the player, an intricate and engaging combat system, beautiful, lively worlds to explore, an epic quest that ties it all together, and the Star Wars universe backing it all up. Though it may have aged in the visual and gameplay department, the quality voice acting, incredible writing, and world building make it a timeless classic and a must play for any Star Wars fan. Graphics may age, but a good story can be enjoyed for the rest of time. There's a reason why Knights of the Old Republic is considered one of the greatest games of all time, and it is for these reasons why it is well worthy of that title. And that is why Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic is so awesome. But what do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Do you prefer light side or dark side and why? What do you think of the story, the game overall, and all that jazz? Hope you enjoyed the video, like it if you did, and subscribe to The Act Man for more awesome content. That's all I got for today. This is The Act Man, signing out. Peace!